Hello. How's everyone doing? Let's see. I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to kind of come in, um, get settled in and ready for another cram session. So welcome. I'm Emily. Uh, this is anti-social studies. Uh, for those of you who weren't uh, around for our first session yesterday, um, I am a WAP teacher in Austin, Texas. I also have a podcast called Anti-Social Studies, and I've been just making a lot of videos to kind of help y'all hopefully get ready for this test that's on Thursday. We're so close. Um, so uh, yesterday I went over 12, the years 1200 to 1450. So if you weren't there, you can find that video on my YouTube channel. Um, and then today we're going to go over 1450 to 1750. And then tomorrow we're doing the last time period, bringing it all the way up to 1900. So um, yeah, everyone's come in and say hi in the chat. Um, let me know um, if y'all have any questions. Um, I will do my best to address things in the chat. Um, yeah, Aaron asked a really good question. I'm posting the PowerPoints on my website. So I can go ahead and show you where to find them as we're letting everyone kind of get settled in. So let me share my screen. Um, okay. So yeah, you can go to my website, which is antisocialstudies.org. Um, and I'm pulling it up here so I can show you where to go. I haven't posted this one. Actually, I have posted this one already. I was more organized than yesterday. So you will go to the WAP resources, AP exam resources. This is the page where I kind of dump all the different things that I'm making. So it's not the most organized because I'm just like trying to do it fast. But you'll see a lot of different things. Um, I've made some review materials, like I've made spice charts that can be helpful for organizing your notes. Um, but if you scroll down, you'll see I've made some practice DBQs that you can use. Um, if you keep going down further past my videos, you'll see content review stuff. So this is where I'm putting the YouTube cram sessions. Here's the PowerPoint I did yesterday and a link to the recording from yesterday's session. And then here's the PowerPoint we're gonna go through today. And then when we're done, I'll post the link up here as well. Um, and so I'm posting these for y'all. You're welcome to download them and use them, uh, reference them later. So I know some of y'all are taking notes. Some of you might just wanna watch and then go back and look at the slides later on. So. Um, also, the other thing that I mentioned yesterday, I just have to do like a little bit of a shameless plug because we're in this world now. But um, if you haven't already, please follow me on Instagram. Um, I'm really active, especially getting ready for the AP test every day. I am posting like I'm kind of making up prompts that I think would be good prompts for on the AP test. And then I'm answering them for you. Um, but I'm also going to be doing just a lot of like kind of cram stuff over the last few days. So if you haven't already followed me, then please go do that. Um, and hopefully you'll find it helpful. For a lot of you who are maybe sophomores and are going on and next year are gonna maybe be in a push or AP Euro or something like that. Um, I'm gonna do my best to kind of grow with y'all um, and maybe provide some resources for those classes as well. So if you thought this stuff was helpful, um, I make a podcast and all that good stuff that could be helpful for later years as well. So I have a US history uh, season that's going on right now. So if you do go on next year and take US history, and you like the way I explain things today, then maybe check that out and maybe it'll be helpful for in addition to your class. Okay, um, enough like selling, selling my stuff. Um, so today we are just gonna cram the years 1450 to 1750. Uh, the big gist of this, oh, hold on, it paused. Let me try that again. Um, the big gist of this unit is the rise of Europe. Right, it's the rise of Europe and it's the incorporation of the Americas into uh, the trading world. So that's really it. Um, obviously there are other things happening all around the rest of the world and we'll talk about that too. But the biggest thing, and, and this time period is really a transitional time period. So this um, is a, a transition where there's a lot of opportunities to talk about change and continuity, a lot of opportunities to talk about causation, um, new things happening because obviously we're like expanding what we think of as the globe. And we also have like a new region, Europe, that's becoming way more influential than they were before. Um, yes, this will be recorded and posted later. So I've posted my cram session from um, yesterday up on my YouTube and I'll do the same here. Uh, yeah, and apparently Heimler like is, is getting in on my YouTube live. He must've heard how well this one went yesterday because um, Heimler's also doing cram reviews, which is awesome. So if you're here, thank you. And then go check out his recordings. Um, some of you maybe are watching later because you were in Heimler's review, which is great. And hi, thanks for watching it later on. 
Okay, so yes, all these PowerPoints will be up on the website and I'll be posting the um, I'll be posting the YouTube link when we're done. All right, so here's the big idea. This is a few reminders from yesterday, a few reminders from last time period. Basically states are either these kind of old school traditional land-based empires, or they're these new kind of small trading states. And we have all those states are maintaining power by controlling trade routes and fostering innovation and exchange. The thing that I want to point out about this is that nothing really changes in this time period, except that what's unique about Europe is that they sort of kind of, they combine these things together. They kind of, in some ways, create a new type of empire where they are still small trading states. Think about Portugal or England, but they're going out and creating empires that are not actually land-based, they're sea-based empires. Right. So you think of something like a, a state like Portugal, which is very small and even at its height doesn't actually control a ton of land, but they have a ton of power and influence around the world. And they do that by controlling trade. Um, they gain that power by fostering innovation and they they maintain power by, you know, being in charge of or the middleman for exchange. So what really kind of happened, if you look back at it, is like Europe during its Middle Ages was just sort of sitting back, digging in the dirt, like watching watching to see what was working. And then they kind of come out of nowhere, at least from the eyes of a lot of people in Asia, and just kind of like take different elements of these different state building techniques and turn them into something kind of new to go around and conquer the world. So um, the thing also to think about in this time period is that Europe is not on top in this time period, right? This is what's happening is these more traditional powers, um, Muslims around the Middle East, um, Islamic and like the gunpowder empires, uh, Russia's rising, Japan, China, they're all still doing very, very well. Europe is rising. And during this time, they're sort of meeting at the same point. And what we're going to see in the last time period that we'll talk about tomorrow is that Europe kind of continues to rise and modernize. And the states that do, like Japan, come with them. And the states that don't, like China, struggle. So this is really kind of the transition period. Okay. And yes, this will be posted on my channel afterwards. Um, the PowerPoint will be posted up on my website for everyone who's just joining us. Okay, so Europe is starting to want more trade with Asia, but other states are in the way, specifically the Ottoman Empire. Um, so the Europeans, if they want to get to Asia, um, they can go through the Mediterranean, but they run into the Italian city-states that are charging them a lot of money, and they run into the Muslims who are also charging them taxes and money. And so they're trying to figure out a way to get around these places. I say this because any DBQ where the topic is like Europeans being involved in Asia or the Indian Ocean, this could be really useful context, right? Going back and saying like, why did they start looking for another route? Or if you have a DBQ about the Europeans in the Americas, um, this could be context. They wanted to try to go around the kind of Islamic empires. And so they go this way and they bump into the Americas. Anyway. Um, hi, Rachel. I love you too. Hey. Okay. So first we got to figure out like, how did Europe get here? They do kind of come from nowhere in a lot of people's minds. And so what's happening in the last few hundred years is that monarchs are slowly solidifying their power and kind of taking that power from the feudal lords and other rival power structures like the church. So they do that in different ways, right? Ivan the fourth or um, Ivan the terrible as the nobles called him had sort of a brutal militant secret police that would like intimidate and pressure nobles uh, who weren't loyal to Ivan. That's why they called him the terrible. Uh, we have Louis the 14th builds Versailles and holds court where all the nobles have to come and like live with him and serve him. Henry the eighth leaves the Catholic church and creates his own church so that he can divorce his wife. But also he's now in charge of the church and gets all that tax money. So again, other good context for the rise of England would be this, because you don't really think about it, but when the queen or king of England now is also the head of the church, that also means all of the church lands in England, of which about a third of England's lands were owned by the church, now go straight to the royal coffers. That's why Elizabeth all of a sudden has all this money to like sponsor literature and sponsor voyages to the new world, all that church money. Um, and so as they're increasing their trade with Asia, they're coming out of the Crusades, the Black Death, um, the monarchs are mostly concerned with taxing. How can we tax and get this wealth? And this is something they do really well. This is something that other more traditional empires don't adapt to as quickly, is recognizing that it's not just about taxing land anymore. We got to tax trade. Because remember, for most of world history, like well, um, land is power, not wealth, not money. And so you have a lot of older states like the Ottomans 
who are still getting most of their taxes from the land. And that's not changing. It's not growing. It's still the same amount of land. But Europe is kind of forward thinking in this way. And they recognize that they don't have a lot of land, but they can tax trade and they can tax wealth and get really, really rich. And so that's why we have um, new positions like the English justices of the peace or French intendants that were created in the earlier time period, but are really instrumental in like consolidating their power. Okay. So these states then use some of that new money to sponsor innovation and exploration to get to Asia, right? And we kind of know all this, 1492. I think a really good piece of evidence, I talked yesterday in our cram session about how sometimes you can find pieces of evidence that like are really good and they fit a lot of different themes and developments. Like last class, I said the House of Wisdom in Baghdad was one. I think Prince Henry's Navigational School is another one because it could provide context if you're gonna talk about like the Europeans finally reaching the Americas or Asia, it could be an example of state sponsorship of like innovation and new ideas. Um, it's a great example of the development of technology, all that sort of stuff. So um, the Spanish sponsor Columbus's voyages, England kind of creates royal charters that kind of basically say, sure, we will, whatever land you discover is sort of yours as long as you claim it in my name, the King or Queen of England. So the Virginia company was founded um, and it was named after Queen Elizabeth because she was nicknamed the Virgin Queen because she never married. So, doo, doo, doo. all right, uh, this is all going to be posted on YouTube later and this PowerPoint is already posted on my website. So, so today let's see first what changed. We're going to talk about change in continuity. So we're going to see um, what changed when we discover, air quotes, the Americas and trade becomes global. And then we're going to talk about what things didn't change and, and kept going. So the biggest change is like the American states were conquered, right? And I think we all kind of know this pretty well, right? So we have the conquest of especially the Aztecs and the Inca empires, and we have the discovery of silver in now the Spanish colonies, which is gonna just skyrocket Spain to like number one. It was Portugal because they got out there first with Vasco da Gama and they settled all these like port cities. But when the Spanish discover these massive silver mines, like literally mountains made of silver, um, they now skyrocket and become the most powerful empire in the world. They adopt the Incan Mita system to use like labor in the mines, but then it becomes much more coercive and much more violent. Um, let's see. Another change that occurs. Oh, here's an exception. I always like to throw out some examples of complexity because everyone wants to know what that is. So an example of complexity would be, let's say you're arguing that like the, you know, the European discovery of the Americas was bad for American states, which is like 99% of the time true. They fell, they died of disease, whatever. But here's one exception, at least for a while, right? The Comanche adopt um, warfare on horseback and actually like develop a bigger empire in the American Southwest because of horses that came over on the Columbian Exchange. Now, of course, later on, they're gonna be conquered and manifest destiny by the United States, but it is an, an interesting note that complexity can sometimes be show, showing an exception to the rule, right? It's kind of like a counter argument where you say, well, here's my argument, and this is mostly true, but here's one or two times when it's not. And that shows that you understand nuance and that it's not all like black and white. Okay. Do, 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 do. I love that y'all are like answering each other's questions in the chat. Y'all are so great. Um, I'm going to stop every once in a while and skim through the chat. But yeah, if you see, if, so, if someone's asking a question and you kind of know the answer to that, Please help me out. That's so awesome. So another change that occurs is the Columbian Exchange. We know this. Potatoes, tomatoes, bananas, all the stuff that makes a really good taco come from the Americas, right? Um, I live in Austin and where tacos are king. And it's basically like you couldn't have any of that without the stuff from the Americas. Um, we obviously have like domesticated animals come from Europe that are very important, but also disease. So Sean, why it's an exception, the, um, sorry, there's a lag in the chat. So the reason why the Comanche are an exception is because I'm talking about like the conquest and decline of American states when the Europeans arrive, but the Comanche actually rise and become more powerful after the Europeans show up because they adopt horseback, right? Like they didn't have horses before and they actually use warfare on horseback to conquer more land. So it's actually like a rare example of an American civilization that rose and actually became more powerful after the Americans showed up or the Europeans showed up obviously for a while, eventually they fall. Okay, do, 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 do. we see the rise of cash crop plantation agriculture and new forms of coerced labor, specifically sugar in the Caribbean and Brazil, cotton in the American South. We have a new form of coerced labor, which is chattel slavery, which is new 
and it's the first kind of race-based slave system in world history, and it's the first slavery system where the enslaved people are property and not human, right? So it's the chattel sounds like cattle because they come from the same root. So it's the first time really that we have a slave system where slavery is an inherited trait. If your mother was a slave, you also are, and where it is like uh, clearly defined and identified as one race. Up until this point, we had had um, a lot of different slave systems, but they weren't race-based. You might have a lot of slaves that happen to be African, but that wasn't because they were black, they just happened to be, right? Yeah, thanks y'all. I know Heimler, when I saw Heimler posting about his review thing, I was like, dude, I even like sent him a message. I'm gonna see if maybe we can like do a joint review maybe on Wednesday, that would be awesome. But I was like, dude, I'm already doing 2 p.m. and this is when my kid is napping. It's the only time I can do this. So anyway, thanks for joining. So. Um, we also see the discovery of silver in the Americas fuels a global silver boom that is uh, really, really helpful for Spain. <coughs> um, chattel, and it's chattel spelled, not that spelling really matters on the test, but chattel slavery. Um, it is everywhere in the Americas, but it is the worst in the United States or the pre-United States. So, um, but yes, we also see it in Brazil. Typically in Latin America, they kind of humanize their enslaved people, at least a little bit earlier than other places do. They give them some basic rights, which isn't good, but it's better than nothing, right? Okay. So we also have colonial hierarchies that are now creating new elites. So this is another thing that's changing as a result of this expanding global trade. Um, we have the casta system in Spanish America, which is literally a rigid caste system. You're born and on your birth certificate, it says you are a mestizo. And then you have certain rights based on what caste you're born into. Um, we have the encomienda system, which is sort of like feudalism, but in Latin America. So the Spanish king would like give a chunk of land to an encomendero who then would be in charge of that land. Uh, Christianizing the natives, he could use them as labor. Um, eventually it gets abolished because it's pretty cruel. And there are a lot of Catholic, um, especially Franciscan like friars and monks who speak out against this. So to someone's question about chattel slavery also being in um, South America, um, in a lot of ways, a lot of the like Catholic priests kind of reject the really, really strict form of like coerced slavery um, as as unchristian. So, oh, the difference between mita and comienda hacienda chattel. That's a great question. So, um, and do you need to know specific terms like mestizos? I mean, no. Like, you're not going to be asked a DBQ about mestizos, but you might be asked a DBQ about social hierarchy, and this could be a document, right? This casta system. And so, again, all of this, like, specific terms that you know and that sort of thing, is all like outside evidence. It's all stuff that will help you better understand the documents or that you can then bring in on your own. But um, keep in mind, right, that you have notes available to you, right? So if there are terms that are hard for you to remember and you just wanna put them down somewhere so you can reference them if you need to later, that's fine. So the difference between those, so Mita first existed under the Inca and it is basically, the Inca had no money. The Inca had no currency at all. Um, everything was barter. And then instead of taxing, cause there's no money, they did the Mita system, which was a labor tax. So basically three times in your life, if you were healthy, you as a person in the Inca empire would spend three months serving your um, government where you would work in the palace or serve the emperor. You would spend some other time in your life, three months serving your God, building temples, building Machu Picchu, whatever. And then three months serving your community where you would build roads and work in farms and that sort of thing. And so basically like you just had three 90 day periods of labor in your life where you had to work for the Inca and then that was it, that was your tax. So when the Spanish come along, there's that system already in place, they're like beautiful. Now you just owe your mita to us, the Spanish and you have to come and work in the silver mines. And it's like really, really brutal coerced labor. Um, chattel slavery is a specific type of slavery that basically identifies slaves as property that can be bought and sold and as property where the children of those slaves are also slaves. So it is an escalation. In previous slave systems, the slaves were still seen as people. They were just people that like couldn't move freely or take jobs freely. They like had, to, they were owned by a person or owned by a company and had to work there. They were still seen as human beings. They often could marry or whatever. Chattel slavery is like what in the United States we, we understand 
which is that very like strict system. Um, Encomienda and Hacienda, Encomienda comes first. Encomienda is like state sponsored. It's like feudalism. It's like you are now the Lord, the encomendero of this chunk of land. And then it's yours to do with what you will. Then a bunch of the Catholic priests kind of object to this because they're basically using the Native Americans as slave labor. And so they abolish the encomienda system and set up the hacienda. So the hacienda is more like, it's more um, low key, right? It's not like as state sponsored. Basically a lot of these like great estates that were encomiendas just sort of become private haciendas. They might be big ranches or big plantation farms. And the biggest difference is it's like the difference between feudalism and like being a serf and a peasant, right? So on an encomienda, if you were a native person, you were a serf. You were now tied to that land and had to work that land. With an hacienda, you are free to leave if you want to. But obviously, you don't have a ton of opportunities. So you're now like a peasant. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So um, also, hierarchies are changing in Europe. So with the discovery of the Americas, um, middle-class white men have a lot more opportunity. Get it, middle-class white men, nicely done. So they find new opportunities to gain wealth because for context, in feudal Europe, there is a system called primogenitor, which meant the first son inherited all the land. So again, land equals power and land equals wealth. So if you were the first son, you inherited all that land and your younger brothers just like got some money. And before that wasn't super useful. So a lot of those sons would go join the church or join the military or whatever. But now there's another option. They can become a merchant or an explorer. They can go in with their friends and create a joint stock company and go to the new world where they can get land and they can get power. And so again, if you have a question about social hierarchies or new elites, you don't want to just think about the ones that are being destroyed, right? Where you have people being conquered and put down. You also want to think about people being lifted up. Like what are, are there now opportunities for social mobility where there weren't before? Okay. States still controlled trade. This is so important. This slide is so important. This slide is like the transition of the global economy is mercantilism. And it seems really dumb and really obvious to us now. But before this time period, um, wealth or land was power and land was wealth. If you were a state and you wanted to tell how powerful you were, it was like, how much land do you control? How many people do you control? Europe changes that with mercantilism where they say, well, really just wealth is wealth. Money is wealth. Having silver or gold is wealth and power on its own, which today seems totally obvious. Like, oh yeah, money means power. But that was sort of new. Remember in Asia, a lot of those states really looked down on merchants. Like you're not producing anything. You're just trading things. Like what have you been doing? And so Europe sort of capitalized on this because they didn't have access to a lot of their own land, right? They weren't at least at this point, creating these massive empires, but they now did have access to a lot of wealth and a lot of trade opportunities. So mercantilism does come two different things at once. It is basically establishing that trade itself is a worthy endeavor that generates wealth and like wealth and like money and currency will lead to a more powerful state if the government controls it, if the government is in control of that trade. So this is why, um, the American colonists were so annoyed and so frustrated that like they couldn't trade with Spain, right? Or they couldn't, um, the colonists couldn't grow certain things or couldn't make certain things. So the colonists could like grow cotton, but they couldn't create textile mills in the South because that was what England did. That's mercantilism. It's basically England saying like, okay, we can gain power another way by getting a lot of money, but we have to really strictly control our economy if we're going to do that. And so it's not capitalism, but it's like a stepping stone towards capitalism, right? This is like highly like state controlled economy, but it shifts the whole view of wealth and power in world history. And this is the thing where some older states catch on to this and some don't, right? This is why when England in the next time period knocks on the door in China and is like, hi, we'd like to trade with you more, please. China doesn't get it. They're like, you're just a little England. Like, we're not worried about you. And then cut to like the opium wars and all these things, right? It's sort of like, but Japan, especially because they are also a smaller nation, they recognize this and they start to get on board. Some states start to adopt more of a mercantilist policy and a focus on trade, whereas other older states are focusing on older ways of gaining and maintaining power because that's what's worked for them in the past feel very passionately about mercantilism. I hate it, but it's like very, very important. 
Um, yeah, so Mason said it a different way, right? Mercantilism implies that colonies exist for the mother country's benefit, right? Like they get, the mother country gets to dictate what you make, what you produce, what you can and can't produce, and you can't trade with anyone else. And it's the reason why the Americans like dumped a bunch of tea in the harbor, so. Um, yeah, and I hadn't really thought about it this way, but there's a question in the chat about this idea of fixed wealth. And yeah, I mean, if you're saying now that like hard currency, like gold and silver, is power, sorry, there's like a wasp in my room I'm realizing. So if I all of a sudden panic and run away, that's why. So yeah, if you're saying that, well, I mean, there is a finite amount of gold and silver in the world. Now the Spanish just found a bunch more, which is very exciting. But so yeah, this is also gonna lead to a lot of increased competition where it's like, okay, wait, there's only so much gold in the world. There's only so much diamonds eventually, only so many of certain resources. So we all need to compete to get those. Y'all are so smart. Um, yes, this is like for context, right? We're now in like the 14, 15, 1600s. So this is the Renaissance is occurring. The scientific revolution is occurring. We're starting to get a little bit enlightened. Those different things are also happening at the same time. Okay, cool. So massive change, right? And that's, there's a ton there that could be in a DBQ. Um, the most common theme in the WAP DBQs is trade. Like if you go back and look at all the DBQs they've ever asked, the most common one that pops up is something about trade and trade networks, right? Now, last year, the DBQ was on the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean. So I'd be very surprised if like there was that again, but there's, there's always been essays on like transatlantic trade or how like the discovery of the new world impacted things back home or wherever. And so I think if you're gonna pick themes to study over the next few days, I would say the one to spend your most time on is like economics, trade and exchange and like how that impacts places. So how that changes their society or changes their culture or changes states or whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, the impact of the Renaissance on world history. Mm, the impact of the Renaissance um, on, in general is the development of a thing called secular humanism, which basically means Europeans were focusing less on God and the other worlds, and they were focusing on human beings. So it's why we see, like, instead of a million paintings of baby Jesus, we now start to see paintings like the Mona Lisa and seeing, like, regular people as worthy of our time and our art. And so that gets reflected in other more meaningful ways, like in science. We're going to now observe the natural world um, in the Protestant Reformation, right? We're going to like read the Bible ourselves, have a personal relationship with God. So the Renaissance itself is just like for art history is massive. For world history, it's more just like, it's a sign of this shifting attitude in Europe towards more secularism, which is gonna lead to like exploration and all that sort of stuff. Um, would the topic of Mongols and industrialization be a good prompt to study? I mean, obviously not together, but yes. So yeah, I mean, anything with economics, I would really kind of focus on because it's always there. It's always in the background. So even if the prompt isn't about economics, that could then be your context, right? I mean, the industrialization, the industrial revolution is amazing context for so many different essays you could talk about in the 17 and 1800s. So again, I'm just going off of like what the college board emphasizes and what they emphasize is trade and exchange and then how that leads to new hierarchies, changing hierarchies, which we just talked about and how it leads to new cultures like syncretism, that sort of thing. So let's see what stayed the same. Um, a lot of things stayed the same, right? So back in Afro-Eurasia, these land-based empires are still trucking along and doing very, very well. And so you have the so-called gunpowder empires, which are really the Ottomans, the Safavids and the Mughals. Um, because they, at some point or another, adopt gunpowder technology. The Ottomans do it first. A great piece of outside evidence would be something like the Ottoman Safavid War. Um, this is where the Ottomans versus the Safavids, they went to war. The Ottomans, they meet at a battle and the Ottomans have cannons and the Safavid have mounted cavalry with swords. And so like, spoiler alert, the Ottomans win. And right after that, the Safavid leaders start adopting gunpowder technology. So it's a really great specific example of a state being like, oh shoot, okay, we need to innovate. We need to adopt this new technology and kind of update things, right? Um, keep in mind, there were people within these empires that were hesitant to update. If you're a Janissary, um, if you're in the traditional elites, um, like the, um, the cav mounted like cavalry in the Safavid empire, you don't want to change and adopt new technology because that might displace you. Um, interestingly, in the Ottoman Empire, the Janissaries at first were so low because they were these enslaved people. 
<clears throat> that they gave them control of the guns. They were sort of like, ah, eh, we don't really need these. These are sort of these like dirty kind of European weapons. You deal with those. And the Janissaries are like, well, this seems helpful. And so over time, the Janissaries are able to rise and become more influential um, because they're given access to this new technology. So um, in the Qing Dynasty, we also have examples of like still continuing to innovate. Um, Emperor Kangxi, who was the, one of the Qing emperors, creates a dictionary which standardizes the whole Han language, still trying to like unify China. He sends out basically map makers to create surveys that are the most extensive surveys of China up until this point. So the point is just that like, it's not like Europe starts renaissancing and conquering the new world and everywhere else just falls apart. They're all still doing their thing and doing very, very well. The question is just going to be like, how much are they paying attention to what's happening in the new world? Because the next era, it's going to come to them and they're going to have to figure out like, how do we, how do we deal with this? And yes, Dev Shirme is the process of taking the, getting those Janissaries. So the Ottomans would, um, especially when they conquered new places like the Balkans. So when they conquered up here in the former Byzantine empire, where there were a lot of Christians, they would basically like part of the tribute that these new conquered places have to pay, they have to send one of their sons to then serve in the Ottoman Empire. They would be converted to Islam. Now, interestingly, it was actually a weird opportunity for social mobility because if you became a, like a Janissary, you actually became eventually like an elite part of the military or you might become a bureaucrat and someone working in the government administration, which is a lot of power. So it, it's like, it's a little more complex than just, it's not just slavery, but it is a form of coerced labor that like there are some parents who like wanted their child to be taken, to go be a, be a slave, but because they were gonna get all this opportunity and this education and this training that they wouldn't have gotten. Anyway, okay. Boop, boop, boop. Um, I'm looking, cool. Y'all are all answering each other's questions, which is great. I'm just troubleshooting. If someone says like a wrong answer, I'll make sure to point it out. But in general, like this is, this is all good and very helpful. So, <clears throat> Another continuity that's happening is that like small states are still benefiting from trade. We talked about this last time period too, right? That a lot of times the ones that are smaller, like, um, well, eventually the Portuguese, but like Malacca, like these smaller trading states, that still continues. It's now just becoming more focused on the Atlantic. So Portugal becomes the most, is the first kind of most important European empire. We also see the rise of African kingdoms that um, gain a lot of power and influence by participating in the slave trade, right? So this is again, an opportunity for complex complexity. If you're gonna talk about the slave trade and it's obviously terrible impact on Africa and on African people, but for complexity, there were some states that benefited from it, right? It's like all of Africa is not one place, it's massive. And so if you're talking about slavery and the slave trade and like the terrible toll it's taking, but then you said, however, one exception to this would be the Ashante kingdom who actually like developed a relationship with the Portuguese, the, Congo, the kingdom of the Congo did too, to where they were like, well, just don't trade us, but like, we'll, we'll give you other people that aren't our people to trade, right? And that's where a really famous document that shows up a lot is a letter from the king of the Congo to the king of Portugal being like, we were fine when you were taking other slaves, but now you're starting to take our people and we're like, not okay with it, right? Okay. So um, <clears throat> another continuity is that states are still using religion to unite each other. We talked about this yesterday. It's like, a, it's always occurring to some extent. We now see it more with Christianity, right? So in this last time period, we talked a lot about the spread of Islam. Islam kind of coming to create this Dar al-Islam, becoming very influential in Southeast Asia. We talked about China using Neo-Confucianism. India is still, even though they're controlled by an Islamic government, they're still predominantly Hindu. But now we're seeing this other trend, these blues and purples, right? This is actually a map of today, the main religion today, but it still holds, right? So blue and purple, blue being Protestant Christianity and purple being Catholicism. Now that religion is really spreading dramatically around the globe where the Europeans are going, right? Was Akbar the one who banned slavery, like in the Mughal Empire? Um, I don't know actually if Akbar banned slavery, but I do know Akbar was really big on like tolerance. He definitely he ended the tax against non-Muslims. He tried to create a new religion that would like combine everyone's faiths together. So maybe that might be something to ask Google. So. 
States also use other cultural practices to justify their rule still. Uh, so you have the Qing dynasty when they come in and conquer the Ming, they're Manchu, they're an outside group. So this is another example, right? If you're wanting to provide context or complexity, let's say you're writing an essay and you're talking about the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs and you're like, this foreign group is coming in and asserting their culture and their dominance and whatever. You could say the same thing's happening in China with a few hundred years later with the Manchu coming from the North in Manchuria and conquering the Han Chinese and creating the Qing dynasty. So that's what the College Board is looking for is that you can take two events that seem totally distant and maybe unrelated and being like, but hey, they're actually, they have some similar things going on, which is why you see me a lot of times lumping different regions together because I want you to be making those connections. So they required all men to wear their hair in the queue, um, which is this long braid. It was a traditional Manchu style. Um, in the new world, the Spanish um, had the requerimiento, which I think I mentioned yesterday, which is basically like a document being like, do you accept our God? Do you accept that all this land is ours now for God and the Pope? Um, and they read it in Spanish and all the native people don't know Spanish and are like, I guess, because you're probably going to kill me otherwise. And then they're like, cool, we did it. We converted everyone. So again, an exception here, which I was just talking about, is that while a lot of states right now are like inserting their religion on top and using it to conquer another place, um, Akbar is a great exception to that rule because like I said, he was a very tolerant leader. He created a thing called the divine faith, which kind of combined Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism all together. And the idea was like, we all have more in common. Let's just start kind of combining our faiths. It didn't work, but it was like a nice, a nice try. There's now a religion that's called, I think, Baha'i, which I would imagine is maybe descended from that or was inspired by that. So a few people were asking about kind of logistical things, um, like citing documents and stuff. Yeah, you can cite documents however you want. Um, you can say in document one, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. You can put a parenthesis at the end. Um, and I should have mentioned before, if y'all have other questions about the DBQ itself, like about how to write it, what your strategy should be, or the different rubric points, I've done videos on each of those here on my YouTube channel. So obviously these videos are like content review, so I'm not talking very much about DBQ strategy, but that's because on my YouTube, I already have videos where I've gone in depth about like, here's what context is and here's what it looks like, or here's what outside evidence is and here's how it's different from context. So if you have more of those questions, um, keep asking them because people in the chat can help you out, but also know that I have those on my YouTube page as well. So yeah, the big thing with citing documents is, is it doesn't really matter. There's not like one style that's preferable. Some people think saying like in document one is awkward, but it's not an English essay. Like no one, no one cares. I'm a grader. I don't care. As long as I see document one somewhere, I'm good. Okay. Um, oh, deism would be another good example. Deism would be another cool kind of combination that's coming about in the Enlightenment in Europe where they're sort of figuring out how can we still be Christian, but also be scientists and also believe in science. And so they're kind of creating the enlightenment is also creating this sort of new religion. That's a, I never thought about that as like syncretism, but it kind of is. It's like taking Christianity and then the scientific faith, right? I mean, like that belief system and kind of combining them together. That's a cool thought. All right. Um, do, do, do. Okay, let's get on to more context. States still using cultural practices just by the rule. This is the era of imperial portraits. If there's a DBQ from this time period, I, it's very likely you might get an imperial portrait because there's so many cool ones. Um, and so in general, <coughs> in general, um, I do a whole video on evaluating the documents, like talking about the point of view or the context or the intended audience. I do a whole video on that, so go check that out. In general, the visual documents are the hardest to evaluate unless it's a portrait. Because you want to think about if it's, this is like an imperial or a royal portrait, there is a very clear purpose and a very clear intended audience, right? This is literally how this ruler wants to be remembered forever. And so this is a really great opportunity to pull in to evaluate that source because you can talk about like how they want to be seen. So for example, these two portraits are of the same person. They're both of that emperor Kangxi of the Ch uh, Qing dynasty. But you notice like this purpose is very different from this one. Right, so the purpose here is to portray wealth and power. Right, um, he is wearing this like amazing robe. He's covered in jewels and pearls. This is obviously to portray like conquest and strength. Um, and so again, this would be a great opportunity to hip this document and talk about the purpose of one. Uh, you'd probably get one of these portraits of like what they're trying to portray and what they've included in the painting to do that. 
Another really famous example that I always like talking about is this one of Elizabeth I, right? Um, because you can see a really clear like purpose and intended audience. She literally has her hand on a globe being like, I control this now. Um, in the back, you see ships going off into the sunset, probably to found colonies. You see Spanish ships being destroyed, like the Spanish Armada. Um, you see a mermaid where she's like, I see you sailors, you like mermaids, me too. Like there's all this stuff in here that you could pull out in a DBQ to evaluate this source. So just um, a quick note on that, right? That you see a lot of imperial portraits during this time. This is another famous one of Shah Jahan or no, Jahangir from the um, Mughal empire. And they're just, they're kind of, they're not weird. It just might be something you haven't seen before. But if you get one of these, try evaluating its purpose because it can be really fun to be like, what are they trying to portray? This is literally a six foot high life-size portrait. So right there, you could talk about the purpose. Like he wants to portray strength and power, but you notice like his feet are on the ground. Um, hit, the world is in his hands, but his head is like has a halo. So his head is with the gods, his hands, his work is with like the world and his feet are grounded and like rooted right there, you could have a really cool analysis of what he's trying to portray about himself as a ruler. Anyway, do I have a video on analyzing pictures? No, that'd be really useful. I do in my video about hip, about evaluating sources, I specifically bring up pictures. So check that out. And then um, in general, like the reason why I don't do a whole video on that is that they've told us that really just one of the five documents is going to be a visual. So you could ignore that one and still be fine, right? I mean, because you can get 10 out of 10 points if you um, use four of the five documents. So that's why if visuals are like, you're good with that, then great. You know, there's gonna be one on there, but if you're not great with that, you know, you can skip that one too. So, all right. Uh, thanks for sticking with me y'all, we're almost done. States also use monumental architecture to maintain their rule. The Taj Mahal is a great example. Look how powerful I am. Here's my wife's body will live forever and tourists will come forever and visit. Um, I also like this example. This is Kori Kancha, which was the Incan Temple of the Sun. You can see the Incan stones, no mortar. They were amazing architects. This was the Garden of Gold, where there were literally life-size statues of like llamas and pure gold that the Spanish melted down into bars and sent back home. Um, I like this one because they literally take the stones and then create, I think it's a Spanish, um, it was a mission, and then it's going to be a church and a monastery. Um, and I just like this story because in the 1950s, Peru had a massive earthquake and all of the Spanish buildings fell down, but all the Inca walls stayed standing because they were so much better constructed. The Inca were awesome. I did a whole podcast episode about how much I love the Inca, if you want to go check that out. Um, lastly, the boring part that's actually really important. States were concerned with how to administer and tax their empires. It's not just with the encomiendas. So basically Mughal zamindars are basically encomenderos. It's kind of the same thing. It's the idea that the Mughal emperor is gonna be like, you are my zamindar for this region and you are responsible for like taxing and you know gathering these things. You're responsible for administering that, that sort of thing. Zamindars over time become relatively corrupt. They kind of are taxing more and sending less to the emperor, that sort of thing. Um, viceroys in New Spain are kind of like the governors um, another really cool example is the samurai, right? So you have um, the Tokugawa are trying to take power from the daimyo, the like feudal lords. And one of the ways they do that is they just basically take all the trained samurai and put them on the government payroll and say, you're a samurai for me now, for the Tokugawa shogun. And so now that's kind of taking power from the nobles and the feudal lords who had been like warring against each other for so long and saying now it's sort of our imperial army. I also just like samurai, so. And ninjas came about during this time. Ninjas were people in Japan who also wanted to fight or protect their land, but didn't have the money to become a samurai. Anyway. Um, Samantha, they've, I believe they've said definitely that one document will be a visual. Now that could be a lot of things. That could be a portrait, that could be a map, um, but it's basically that one will be, I think they said non-text. So whatever that means. It could be like a graph of like industrialization or whatever. Okay, so we also have states using minority groups as tools for unification in positive and negative ways. So we see the um, Jews being expelled around Europe during this time, kind of in the late post-classical and the early, um, early modern era. Um, this is kind of a way to start to establish their own national identities, saying we are Christian kingdoms. 
Um, a lot of the Jews were invited and accepted by the Ottomans. The Ottomans recognized the value of the Jewish people, especially the Jews, because there were so many Jewish diasporic communities around the world at this time, the Ottomans recognized that having those cultural connections could be really helpful, right? And so if you have a Jewish diasporic community in Hangzhou, China, um, and now you have like family members that now live in Constantinople, that's gonna help facilitate trade between the Ottomans and China. Um, and they also kind of incorporated, like I said, the Janissaries, these like enslaved conquered people into their administration, which it's like not great, it's slavery and forced conversion and that sort of thing, but it's also like a weird kind of example of them bringing more people in and providing some social mobility. Um, how would you interpret a map? Uh, well, it just kind of depends what the map is showing, right? But typically they'll show you a map of like, it's like, a, it'll be a historical map, not like a map you'd see in a textbook today of just like, here's where Ethiopia is, but it might be a map showing an empire or showing the way a, a kingdom viewed themselves. A lot of times earlier maps will put like whatever kingdom is like in the middle and everywhere else is outside. So there's a lot of ways, but in general, again, there's only gonna be one non-text document. So if you're worried about it, like don't be. Remember that you can get a nine out of 10 on this DBQ and only talk about two documents, which means you really should do three just to be safe. So go check out my video on DBQ strategy where I go in depth about like how you should approach this and don't stress about doing everything. Like you really should probably shouldn't do all five documents. It's probably not worth your time. Okay, lastly, the Indian Ocean Exchange is still the main prize. Like still for a few hundred years, most Europeans saw the Americas as like an obstacle. We just gotta get through this thing to get to Asia. That's why so many of like the French and the Dutch and the English are trying to find a Northwest Passage. They're like, we just gotta get through this place. It wasn't for a while before they realized like, oh, actually like this land's pretty valuable too. And so we see rising competition between at first the Portuguese, but um, Europeans in general with the Muslims. So there's a series of war bet wars between the Portuguese and the Ottomans where they're kind of competing for these Swahili coast kind of city states. Um, we also have com um, competition between the Portuguese and the kingdom and trading city of, or trading state of Oman, which was very influential in this region. You don't need to know the details of these wars. You just need to know that there was like violent competition over trading routes. And again, that was sort of the topic that this was the topic, this one slide of last year's DBQ. So I'd, I'd be very surprised if they did it again, but it could be helpful as context or outside evidence. So if we see on this map, right, we have a lot of these kind of smaller trading states and trading cities and by the 1600s, they're mostly controlled by Portugal. Um, Portugal's then gonna decline and you're gonna get the second wave in the Indian Ocean is like the Dutch and the English and eventually the French, but really the Portuguese kind of set the, set the stage for European control in this region. Um, and yes, those of you who just joined in, I'm going to be posting this video on my YouTube channel. And I'm also, I've already posted this PowerPoint on my website, um, antisocialstudies.org. So all of this will be available to you after we're done. We also see some cool examples of cultural diffusion and the creation of new religions. So West African religions travel with slaves on the Middle Passage and end up in the Caribbean. One of the most famous is voodoo or vodun, which is kind of a combination of different West African beliefs. And there's a little bit of Catholicism like saint worship and stuff in there too. In general, just Latin American Catholicism is kind of its own thing. Um, so this is like the, the cult of the Virgin of Guadalupe. So um, in Mexico, she is like revered. She is based on an Aztec mother goddess called uh, Tonantzin. Um, and basically when the Spanish came along, they had this story where they were like, a Spanish traveler went to the hill where the Aztec mother goddess always was. And he saw a vision of Mary. And so it was a clear sign of like, cool, just start calling her Mary and we'll be good. So you see a lot of like kind of more pagan Aztec things. Like you see the cattle horns and different stuff. She also is darker skinned. She actually looks more, you know, like an indigenous American person. Um, and we have Sikhism rising in modern day uh, Pakistan, which is a combination of Islam and Hinduism in that region. So again, this is another theme that the College Board really likes to talk about is just like as people move and move around, they bring their culture with them and they create new things. Sometimes those things are bad, sometimes those things are positive, it, but, but they're all, all, they're new and they're interesting. <clears throat> now, we end with our exception. Right, this whole PowerPoint has been about expansion. Like trade is expanding, the world is expanding, the Americas exist, Europe is rising. But for complexity's sake, right, there are states that are going, oh, nope, like I don't want any part of this. And the two biggest ones are gonna be China and Japan. 
And so the Ming dynasty specifically, um, they were, this is an amazing example. I would definitely know this as a piece of kind of potential outside evidence because there's so much you could use this for. You could use this for state sponsorship of exploration and innovation. The Ming had a very young emperor called the Yongle Emperor who was very interested in innovation and exploration. And he sent out Zheng He um, throughout the Indian Ocean trade in the 1400s. And he wanted him to go and like, um, he sent them on the so-called treasure fleet, these massive Chinese junk ships that were loaded down with goods. He brought back giraffes from Africa. Um, that's what this is actually depicting, right? Um, and it was really to like show the prestige of the Ming dynasty. However, um, when the Yongle emperor died and another emperor came in, the Confucian scholars were like not into this. The Confucian scholars were like, this is not us. Like, remember we're, we're Confucianism. We don't, we don't care about merchants. We care about um, ethics and our own people and producing things and farmers are admirable and blah, blah, blah. But also what it really was was Confucian scholars were feeling threatened because like, well, wait, now there's going to be this new elite, this new group of people that are merchants and traders and travelers that might usurp our power. So they literally like burned the Ming treasure fleet in the docks. Like the, the ships were in the bay, in the harbors and they burned them or they just like left them to rot. It was a conscious decision by the Ming dynasty to say, we are not going to explore. We're not going to go out, which is always an interesting what if, right? Because this is just a few years before 1492. Like what if, right? I mean, if they maybe kept going, um, China could have discovered the Americas, right? And so I think this is another one of those really cool pieces of evidence that can fit into a lot of different themes and trends in world history. So it's like a cool one to kind of know because you can relate this to a lot of different arguments that you want to make. <clears throat> um, and then finally, the most kind of extreme example is the Tokugawa shogunate. So the Tokugawa shogunate during this time is kind of rising the same way Europe is. They're coming out of a feudal state and they are consolidating power with the shogun in Edo or Tokyo. Um, and they kind of recognize and are fearful of the rising influence of other groups in East Asia and in the Indian Ocean trade. And so they isolate themselves pretty violently. Like they expel all foreigners. They expel all Christian missionaries in the 1630s. They round up all Japanese Christians who'd been converted by these missionaries and kill them or force them to convert back to Shintoism. Um, and they isolate themselves. They basically only allow the Dutch to trade in one port city of Nagasaki. Um, and even that, I've, I've seen documents that basically like the Dutch weren't allowed, they had to sleep on their ships on the water, like they weren't allowed to like stay in Nagasaki. Um, so they were highly restrictive and they really um, limited what came in and came out. Um, and this is going to later be very, very valuable because what they do is they preserve their culture, um, but they get the technology. And we're going to see that this again would be amazing context for the Meiji Restoration. This is like a process that's already starting. The Japanese as an island are a little bit more able to restrict themselves. And so they're able to say like, well, we want that, but not this. Like, we don't want your Christianity, but we want your science. Um, and we don't want to let you in because we've seen what's happening in China. We've seen what's happening in other places. And y'all are starting to like creep in a lot more. And so they really, really like cut themselves off. Um, again, then when they overthrow the Shogun and set up the Meiji Restoration, that will have been very helpful because they now have this foundation of like reverence for Japanese culture, but a lot of technology. So, uh, that's, that's it. That's 1450 to 1750. We have the expansion of global trade with the discovery of the Americas, the rise of Europe, but still powerful trading kingdoms and, and empires in Afro-Eurasia. Um, and we're sort of setting the stage for the next time period where these two are going to clash, right? You have Europe rising and dominating the Americas relatively easily. And then you have these old school empires still doing very well in the Indian Ocean world. And the next time period is where they kind of come to a head. And we're going to see like who kind of modernizes and goes with the changing times and becomes more Western or industrialized and who doesn't. So we have four minutes left. I'm gonna skim through the chat really fast. If you have any last minute questions for me, um, please let me know. I am going to be posting this on my YouTube page as soon as we're done. And I've already posted, let me show you. I've already posted um, my this PowerPoint. So for those of you who came in a little bit later, my website is antisocialstudies.org. 
<laughs> this is where you can find a lot of resources. Um, I also have a podcast called Anti-Social Studies um, if you want to check out later. I know you're cramming for the test. Season one is all of world history, season two is current events, and season three is U.S. history. So if you go through these WAP resources and the AP World exam resources, that's where you're going to see um, all the stuff I've been making. I'm simplifying these developments. I have a lot of like review materials, but for y'all, I have practice DBQs with sample essays. If you wanna scroll past the videos, you'll see YouTube cram sessions. And so this is where I've been posting. This is the PowerPoint for yesterday's and the PowerPoint for today is already up. And then I'll be posting the link to the recording too, but you can find it if you're subscribed to my YouTube channel, you'll find it easily. So the name of my podcast is Anti-Social Studies. You can find it anywhere, like on Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, whatever. Um, if you're into podcasts, check it out. And if you like the way I explain things, it's pretty fun. Um, and so, yeah, what I would ask is just if you thought this was helpful, if you will subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm trying to get over a thousand subscribers, y'all. I like want to, I want to, I'm trying to catch Heimler, but he's like way far ahead of me. So if you'll subscribe and also just share this with friends who weren't here today um, that you think might find this helpful for the AP exam and make sure to check out my uh, other videos. Cause like I said, I've done, you can see them right here. A lot of videos breaking down each part of the rubric. So some of you have been asking about like, how should I study? I did a video on that. Uh, what does a thesis statement look like? I then have a last one that's on strategy, like how, how I would approach this DBQ and what, what points I would try to get all that good stuff. Um, so how you should be studying for the next few days. I mean, at this point, you should just be really focused in, meaning you should just be really focusing on practicing the points in the rubric that you're shaky on, right? At this point, you're not going to all of a sudden learn how to write a DBQ in three days, but you can, if, if you're struggling with something like HIP or evaluating documents, then do a lot of that practice. Go and look at sample DBQs um, that are on the College Board's website. If you go look at past exam questions, they post old DBQs and then they post student samples where they normally say, this one was really good, this one was okay, this one was not good. And so even though the rubric is different, you'll still see examples of students like evaluating sources or bringing in evidence or whatever. So I would say like, you shouldn't go write 10 more DBQs between now and Thursday but you can be a little bit more focused in on like the content you're a little shaky on and also the parts of the rubric that you feel like you need a little more practice in and that's where like you know looking at my video first to kind of get an idea of, of what you're trying to do and then doing that practice and getting feedback from friends or from your teacher or whatever um but again at this point you sort of you know what you know um the test is really a test of skills it really is not a test of content in the way old history tests used to be. Old history tests used to be like memorize and just recite. This really is a test of skills. So um, if you've been doing practice and you've been studying, it's like you're going to know what to do on the time of the test and you're going to mess some of it up. And that's totally, totally fine. You do not need a nine or a 10 out of 10 to do well on this test. Like that's impossible. And so really just go in and like try things. Keep in mind, right, that the rubric doesn't have any negative points. So if you're not sure about something, but you're like, I think this is true, put it out there, right? Worst case, it's not. I've, I've done that with students have been like, well, it's cute, but it's actually not true. It doesn't count off. Um, it just means you don't get that point. But so you should just go in and kind of use the full time, um, put what you know on the page, do your best to use at least three documents, right? And you'll already have a really good foundation. So. Um, yeah, there's no number of paragraphs required. There's no specific amount of topics that you need. You can address each document separately in its own paragraph. Now, I will say if you want complexity, if you want some of those higher points, grouping documents and having topic sentences is much better. But like, there's no points in, in the CBQ for formatting. So there's no points in here for like it being written really well. Don't include similes and metaphors. Historians don't like that. Just like answer the question and address, like use the documents clearly to answer them. Like be as clear and blunt as possible. If that means just saying the intended audience of document one is this, and that means this. Don't worry about it being really pretty and well-written. What I tell my students to think of is think of this as your first draft. It's your first draft of an essay, but you're just then sending it in and not turning in a second draft. And just know I'm a grader, I'm a reader, and I understand that. The graders all understand this is a first draft. We're not judging you on spelling or any of those things. We're judging you on like, are your ideas somewhere on the page? So with that, please subscribe to my YouTube page if you haven't already. Um, please go follow me on Instagram. I'm at anti-social studies for those of you who came in a little bit late. Um, and then tomorrow at the same time, although maybe I'll see if I have to compete with Heimler, maybe I'll change it. So follow me on Instagram so you'll get a heads up if I change the time. 
um, at anti-social studies and I'll be posting because tomorrow we're going to do 1750 to 1900. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to do like an ask me anything about WAP, not about me, but ask me anything about WAP. So that's where we can troubleshoot like any of these other questions that you still have, any content that you still want to go over. We can do that on Wednesday. All right. Thanks y'all for joining me. I really appreciate it. I hope this was helpful. Good luck studying. Y'all are going to do great. Um, all right. Bye y'all.